Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this edition of HR Mentorship Learning Series. Tonight, we'll be looking at one of the key or core area of HR, HSE, Health, Safety, and Environment for HR Professionals. And we have someone who is really a true professional in every sense of it, Mr. Dapo Omolade, who will be facilitating this session for us tonight. He's the CEO of Hybrid Group, and this is his first time on this program. Hopefully, we'll get to see more of him as time progresses. And I'm happy to quickly read out his profile so that we can get to know him a little more and pay attention to him. Okay, he's a qualified safety and sustainability practitioner and consultant with over 24 active and consistent years of experience in occupational health safety, environment, and project management. Also, is very vast in operations, training, and consulting for clients, for example, but not limited to oil and gas, construction, power, energy, manufacturing, and other industries. At the moment, is the CEO of Hybrid Group, a one-stop shop for everything safety training consultancy. He has a master's in environmental and safety management and other professional relevant qualifications such as in the Bosch, Awash, and so on. He's an alumnus of the Harvard School of Public Health, London School of Business and Finance, Lagos Business School, Columbia Southern University, University of Agri, and Beokuta, and so on and so forth. He's the former chairman of our OSH West Africa. He's also the president of Safety, Advocacy, and Empowerment Foundation, SAIF, and the National Publicity Secretary, Oil and Gas Trainers Association of Nigeria, OCTA. Is a board member of Occupational Safety Society of Nigeria. Is also the founder of the Omolade Empowerment Initiative. Too. Is a safety practitioner, entrepreneur, advocate, consultant, trainer, auditor, coach, mentor, and speaker at conferences and forums such as the one we're having tonight. In addition to this, okay, is involved in human empowerment and capacity building. Generally, he is married, lives with his family in Lagos. And his hobbies include reading, social networking, and watching football. So obviously, you know, you should be planning to watch England and Spain right now. Dapo, do you want to tell us who you are supporting? I'd like to hand over control to you, sir. You have the floor, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Aulu and Really appreciate this opportunity to be here. Um, a few moments ago, I sent a message to Fumi. I said, do you know his finals at 8 o'clock? How come I forgot this? I wouldn't have accepted. So, but what has to be done has to be done. So I'm here and uh, I'm supporting England to win the, the cup. It's been a long time. So I'm hoping after missing last session, they will meet, they will be able to get this one. All right. Thank you. <laughs> of course, I'm not, hopefully I'll be able to see the last part. When I told for me, I said, don't worry, you watch the replay. I said, she doesn't understand because if she knows, <laughs> she will understand that replay is not the same thing. But thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Um, it's a very great pleasure to be working and speaking with us in the HR team. Uh, this is you know, one of the very important function in the organization that I've worked with very closely. And in the last uh, few years, I've been trying to build a very solid relationship with the HR because of my understanding of the uniqueness, the interplay, the relationship between what I do and what the HS, I mean the HR professionals do. So that has given me a lot of um, a lot of um, reason, not just to be among them, to be close to them, but also to start learning from them. As a matter of fact, I've been in CIPM, I've exhibited in one of the CIPM conferences in Abuja, where I took my company there. I've had opportunity to also speak in one of the CIPM events. So, and um, interestingly, during my tenure as the chair of IOSH West Africa, I I was one of those people that actually foster the MOU that IOSH presently has with CIPM. Okay, hold on. So, which is a very important um, MOU for collaboration. Please unmute. Okay, I thank you very much. everybody. Yes, sir. All yes. right. 
All right, thank you so much. So, like I said, I fostered a, an MOU between IOSH, you no, know, international. That's IOSH from the UK and uh, CIPM Nigeria, and that MOU is still presently, you know, subsisting. It's, it's, it's ongoing, and there are a lot of things happening within that scope of that MOU. And the reason why I had to do that was because it wasn't difficult for me after a few years of my practice to understand that um, HR team or HR as a function is a very important function for me because the, the understanding of the relationship between the two functions will only promote one thing in the workplace. And that's to ensure that the people, you know, are in good state. So that's why when Fumi mentioned this to me, it wasn't difficult to say yes, because um, this is what I want to do. This is because I also believe that um, there's a whole lot of lacuna, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding between that two functions in the organizations in Nigeria today. I've had to be in, you know, in meetings where I had to mediate between the HR and the safety. Why they're supposed to be working together, it became a very big battle where I had to stand in, mediate, and try to clarify. So I'm also very aware that there can be a misunderstanding, you know? Let me tell you very quickly, even as I start this conversation, that um, um, in the HR space, I mean, the HSC space, especially in Nigeria today, there's a belief from all of us, which we're also trying to change, that if they put you as a safety person under an HR function to report to, then you are not going to be able to perform. That is a misunderstanding, but that's a very strong belief that even when you talk to some of our people that are mentoring and coaching, and you hear in my department, in my organization, we do not have a safety department, so I'm forced to report to the HR and I'm having issues. This is also because there's always this misunderstanding between the HR and HSC, which does not allow for that interplay to take place. I'm hoping that in the next couple of minutes, I'll be able to provide a bit of a light, you know, because I'm, I know I've seen if one or two persons here who are HSC, who are my colleagues, I've seen them on the call, but I know very clearly that majority of people on this call will be HR. So I'm hoping that at the end of this conversation, the narratives will change we we'll begin to have um, a better understanding on how those two functions can collaborate to ensure that the workforce, the people are actually treated as the most important asset in the business. That's the language that everybody speaks. Our people are the most important assets, but you do find out in the, organi in the industry and in workplaces that this is better said than done. So it means there's a whole lot of, we're saying it, but we're not walking the talk. So people are not treated as the most important assets just because there is no understanding of how we should actually work. So I'm hoping that in this session, this clarity will be done and that we'll be able to really improve and make that goal achievable, that the people will continue to be the biggest and the most important asset, they will be the people that you know we cherish, we care for, and we do everything about to make sure that the workplace you know is safe and is good for us. So my goal and objective is to bring an understanding of the critical relationship between health and safety and environment, and then the human resources functions recognizing how their collaboration enhances workplace safety, employee well-being, and organizational success. All right, so thank you so much for the profile. I mean, this is just an abridged part of the profile. Right, so outline, I'll look at a bit of what HSA is and the HR. And I want to say thank you for what um, uh, Ms., uh, Dr., I think it's Dr. Luyemi said, with respect to HSC being a very important, I mean, he actually said, he said it's core, it's core part of HR. I'm so glad to hear that because not many people actually say that. So I'm sure you are saying this from a place of knowledge. There are many, many HR today 
that do not understand the core aspect of HSC within them. As a matter of fact, not seeing HSC as a big component of their own work, that if they ensure that HSC functions work well, then they will achieve their own goal. So I'm going to try and do that and see that interaction between them. Then we'll see how the responsibility, you know, marry one another. Look at some legal compliance and risk management. Look at employee well-being and how a safety culture or what you call the culture of the organization can be developed. Then I will see how we can now look at HSC as a component of HR. So what Dr. Liemi said, I'm going to bring it to the table. How does HSC actually function within the HR scope? And then finally, look at the strategic partnership, how to manage crisis, trends that we are seeing right now and are going to see in the nearest future, and of course the benefits. So let's go. So before I continue, I would like to read this food for thought, a very interesting quote that was given by Dr. John Howard. Dr. John Howard is the director of um, National Institute of Criminal Safety and Health. National Institute of Criminal Safety and Health, that's in the US. And he said, talent management, which I know is what HR people deal with, and safety management are two sides of the same coin. Both aim to protect and to nurture an organization's most valuable assets. This quotation, which I saw some years ago, was one of those things that actually gave me, you know, the challenge and the conviction within myself that I must do everything to work with the HR team because it's so clear that we are actually chasing the same goal. It may appear that we're looking at it from different angle, but indeed it's actually from the same direction. We are looking at it from the same direction. You know, when I speak with my medical team, medical doctors and those in that profession, sometimes I do a lot of harassment and I tell them, that one is very easy. I tell them very straightforward. My job is to make sure that nobody comes to see you, full stop. And they're like, what do you mean by that? If I do my job well in the organization, you will not have people come around to see you. If ever they come to see you, they're not coming in pains. They're not coming in agonies. They're coming with laughter and joy to say, hey, doc, okay, I'm just here to do my check. Just check me. What's going on? Not that the person is coming with a broken head, you know, a, a, a lost limb, or maybe a, a lung that is already, you know, destroyed. So that's what I say to the doctors. But to the HR, I can't say that because everything that we do between the HSA and HR, apart from a bit of a technical issue that we do in safety, majority of what we do falls directly within the HSA. If I'll put it this way, we do the job to make the HR productive. Because when the HR have to produce their uh, metrics at the end of every time, and they need to show their, their figures of how the workers are being happy, how the workers are doing their job, how the workers are excited being in the workplace, HSC make that happen. We are the ones that do the dirty job for the HR to take the glory. And that's why sometimes it gets to a point where it looks like a competition. Hey, why are you doing my job? Okay, I've seen that happen. I will see mention some of them in the course of this conversation where you'd say, Can I, I'm, oh, I'm just trying to do that. Yeah, and HR manager saying, that's not your job. That's my scope of work. You stick to your job. And sometimes that is one of the reasons why my HSC team, uh, no, actually in Nigeria, feel HR, HR do not allow them to do their job because of that you know, very slim space where we have to interface or we have to get into the old system in order for us to make the HR, HR shine. So let me put it here. For an HR professional that wants to shine in your workplace, you've got to make the HSC your friend. And I, I, I'm saying this not because I'm an HSC person, you no, know, I've told you already, I have to start learning HR. I have to learn learning, you know, you know, how to manage, you know, human assets. I have to start learning everything about productivity because I just realized that if I'm able to learn that, then I can understand where the HR function is coming from. But the reality is you want to shine, you want to be the superstar in your workplace, let the HSC people be your go-to. They are the ones that can give you the information even before. They have the capacity in their learning and knowledge to understand what can happen 
and be able to bring it to the table before it occurs. Why you get there and you, why the HR at some point may start getting reactive. HSC people can be proactive right from the beginning. In fact, before the job starts, they can tell from their own experience and training what you will be managing in the next 10 years. I'll give you an example. If you're an HR person working in a dust environment, and when I say dust, I don't mean the dust on the floor. I mean dust that come from materials like chemicals and all of that. Even if that job has not started, that company is still being built. They are still building. They've not even started production. An HSC person can tell the HR that if we don't do this in 10 years' time, you are going to be having to solve this problem with the doctors. I can tell you. I can tell you what the dust can cause. You may not know because it's not your learning. But I'm able to tell that as a chemical dust, there are four pathways it will get into the workforce. You may be thinking, oh, oh, just because I'm giving them nose masks to wear, it means they are covered. I will have the capacity to tell you it can go through their skin. I can tell you it can go through other means that you are not aware of. Just because I've been trained to understand how chemicals get into human body. If you allow me to give you that information from the beginning, you can right from there, begin to plan your budget, plan your training, plan all your interventions to make sure that does not happen. And that's the way it is. So we sit there from the HS to say, go do the dirty job and then let the HR take the glory. That's the way it is because we start it, the HR finishes it. It's the beginning and the ending. Therefore, we're actually supposed to be two sides of the coin, just as Dr. John Howard said in this place. And I want us to put that in perspective as we move on. So before I go here, I would like to hear some interaction in the house. And please, um, it's my way of doing it. I don't know if it's allowed, but I would like to get some interaction in the house. And this could be anybody. And I would like to ask any HR person here, if anybody asks you, let's say, let me make the age a bit um, a bit higher. Let's say an eight-year-old. An eight-year-old is supposed to be in the junior elementary, if I'm not mistaken, getting ready for the senior. If an eight-year-old asks you simple question as, what is safety at workplace? What is safety at workplace? Oh, auntie, oh, uncle, I hear that you do safety in your workplace. What exactly does this safety mean? Can I have one or two persons who would like to speak to that in the house? One or two persons, please. Yes, thank you, Daniel Saiki. Thank you very much. So you can meet and please speak. Daniel, please, can you unmute yourself? Or oh, I need to ask you to unmute. Okay. Okay. We're waiting for Daniel. Sorry. Okay. Uh, hello. Can you yes, hear me I now? I can hear you very well. Thank okay. you. Uh, good. So, um, safety means prevention from accident and reaction towards accident. Prevention, it means um, putting proactive measures in place to prevent it from happening. Reactive okay. means when it happens, what are the control to mitigate the effects. Thank you so very much, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other person, please? Yes, thank you, Priska. Please unmute. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening, thank you. Safety, for my understanding, is the prevention of potential hazard not just waiting for it is a hazard you foresee it may likely happen you prevent mm. that potential hazard okay so thank you so let's let's get this a bit more interesting so Priska has opened up something else so and i need us to look at that word that Priska just opened up now it's a prevention of potential hazard not Priska, you i'll save you Priska. this is not going to be for you but anybody else, not a safety person here, but an HR person, what is that word, hazard, that Priska just mentioned? What does that word actually mean? Can anybody try? 
from the HR team, please. Anybody's hand up? Anybody's hand? I'm very good at calling names if nobody saves us. So I'm going through the names now. Any name that interests me, I'm going to call if nobody is saving us. Hazard. Thank you. Oh, Priska again. Priska, okay, let me allow you since you want to save us. Priska, yes. Yes, Priska, we're listening to you. Okay, I said for me, I think that hazards are anything that anything that has the ability or the potential to harm us now or in the nearest future. Mm, thank you. It could be on, any unsafe, only unsafe act or unsafe conditions that can potentially harm anybody in the, now or in the future. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Daniel, I want to add something to that. Yes. Okay, uh, Azad, as um, Friska has said, Azad is anything that has the potential to cause harm um, and it can come in form of unsafe acts and unsafe conditions. Thank you so very much. It's as simple as you have said. So health and safety or safety has been generally, you know, we do refer this, we do refer to this as HSE, but indeed it's actually two components that have been married together. You know, you have occupational health, married with safety, and then married with environment. Because the three actually are geared towards the same goal. So that's why we call them HSC. But for the sake of the nomenclature, I'll just be saying safety. Just now I'm talking about the three of those three things. Thank you. So a potential, something that has potential to cause harm or hurt to anyone and that something could be anything it could be anything living things non-living things inanimate anything that has potential to cause a harm is a hazard so safety to a five-year-old simply means prevention of that thing that can cause harm to you that thing that anything that can cause harm, prevention of it. And that prevention, of course, I also like what Daniel said, because if you are not able to prevent, you also need to protect. But in the most simply, simple, simplest form of this conversation, you need to look at safety as prevention of harm. Prevention of harm to people. This suggests quickly that people can get hurt. It suggests quickly that people can get harm. And I know in many workplaces, HR people are always right at the forefront when injury occurs because there are many questions they need to answer. In fact, in some conversation, when the incident has occurred and somebody has been harmed, you may not even see the safety again. It's the HR that takes it further, especially when it involves the legal compliance, the issue of compensation, the issue of um, you know regulatory framework, the issue of reporting, you see that the HR are not the people that are moving in. In fact, sometimes the HSC would have even forgotten that something has happened. I was talking to a colleague recently who had a very terrible fatal accident in the organization. And I was asking him, how have you guys solved that problem? Because when he told me that issue last year, there were a whole lot of issues from the families, you know, of the person that was lost. So I was asking, how did that eventually play out? How did you conclude on it? Do you know what he said? Say, oh, that thing, that thing has been closed in my book. Oh, we've closed it. I don't even know if the HR has even completed everything. I need to go and ask. Do you know what that meant? He has finished his own job. He has done his investigation. He has sent his report. He has made his recommendation. He has dropped it on the HR. HR place, can you close out? So then when I say the HSC people start the whole process, the HR finishes it. Then you understand that the two functions cannot be at loggerheads because if I refuse to do my own job, the HR will suffer. If HR refuses to do his own job, the HSC is coming back to also suffer. So there is, there is this very symbiotic relationship that must occur between those two functions. 
And that's what we're trying to look at right now. So health is promotion and maintaining the physical and mental well-being, as simple as it is on the slide. So you talk about several issues, which I know the HR knows very well, occupational health programs, wellness program, mental health support, and all of that. But you will understand very quickly that all these three things that we have talked about here, there's something that can defeat them. And that's the hazard. So who manages the hazard is the safety or the HSC function. If the HSC functions manages the hazard, then you are not going to have an economic issue. You are not going to have a mental health issue. If we manage the hazards or the things that are responsible for causing this. And this is where I said the safety started, the HR finishes it. Safety in its entire sense means ensuring hazard-free work environment through risk assessments, through safety protocols, through preparedness and emergency readiness. And they talk about the environment, which relates to everything about the ecosystem, both the biotic and the abiotic. What do we do in that environment to make sure that the environment can continue to sustain? For example, if you release smoke to the environment where the workers are working, you have created a problem in that environment. And you may soon find out that the workers are falling ill. They are getting sick. They are going to the hospital. You know, HR will go to the doctor and say, can we see the records of all the meds? Who is consuming the meds? Who is consuming all the medications there? Because the hazards are impacting on the workers, the workers will consume the meds. And then the HR will say, oh, our meds are finishing so quickly. What's going on? HSC is not doing its job. The workers are getting sick. Then the HR is spending more money in the medical facility. This is the way the interaction takes place. So it is a function, or the two functions are together and they're supposed to be seamless if we want to ensure the workplace is safe. So what is the importance of HSC? I mean, I won't bore you with this so much because I know we know, but what is important here is the note on that there that according to International Labor Organization, HR team, I need you to understand this right now, that workplace safety protocol is now a fundamental right. <laughs> that is the latest principles and rights at work that ILO instituted in 2022. In 2022, the safety of the workers became a fundamental right in the workplace. Prior to this time, it was not declared as a right. It was declared as a policy and a guideline that the workplace must do. But today, according to ILO, and of course, HR people, you know, we as a country, we are a signatory to the ILO treaty. So we are part of ILO. What that means is this. ILO has instituted now and agreed that if workplace safety is not guaranteeing your workplace, or in your organization, you are violating the right of the workers. The workers have a right, and that right is their safety must be secured. It was not there before now, and that's what I've just added here. Prior to this time, there were four. And all these four is also what HR looks at. But it will surprise you to know that while HR looks at all of this, HS actually enforces this. Freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining. That's labor that I know HR people deal with all the time. Elimination of forced and compulsory labor. That's also a HR issue, but very strong health and safety issue. I have an organization that we're working with, and then suddenly a, an underage was allowed to come into the workplace without the knowledge of the system. And when the owners of the project saw this, I was shocked when I heard from the owners of the business saying, we will not hesitate to take legal action against the contractor that brought an underage to our facility. What does that mean? Because underage, forced labor, child labor, these are issues of health and safety, which HR monitors, but HSC have to enforce. HSC have to make sure it does not happen. Because when you bring child, you know, children to work in the workplace, automatically, you are violating the right of the child. The child is supposed to be in school. 
or being educated, not working at that time. Therefore, you have violated the human right. And in 2022, and you can see the poster here. This was what came up in 2022 as part of the you know celebration for my LO saying a safe and a healthy working environment is now a fundamental right. So it bestows upon of us, all of us HS, HR people here, that this is part of the conversation that we must take to the business. That when health and safety are saying we need the following to make sure the workers are safe, it's no longer a choice. It's no longer an opinion. It's actually a right, according to ILO. I see Daniel's hand, and I assume he wants to ask a question. Daniel, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, okay. So my question goes on the issue of um, child labor, because I've actually had an experience on my site whereby mm. a contractor bring, you know, um, a young person, you know, uh, to mm. to work, and there was argument that if the young young boy, for example, is not under any employment, or if the boy is an apprentice, he can be allowed to work under the supervision of his master. <clears throat> so is that allowed? Okay, so thank you very mm. much. So let's answer that quickly, and it's very straightforward. In Nigeria today, there's a requirement for industrial training, which can also be apprenticeship. If I come into as an industrial training worker, it is understood right from the documentation that I'm here to learn as part of my learning. I'm not here to work. So when somebody comes in and he's being wager, he's being paid, he's on the payroll, then that's labor. But if I come in as an IT or an apprentice into a workplace, I cannot be under wager. I cannot be under people that will be paid at the end of the day because it is understood right from the documentation that brought the person in that is on IT, is an apprentice, is here to learn how to understand the job that he's doing. He's not here to work. A work is different from a learning. So if you can establish that that young worker actually came in as an apprentice, then and your documentation provide for that to say this person came as an apprentice, not a worker. His name should not be on the worker's list. Because if his name is on the worker's list, then you have basically told us you are paying him, so he's a worker. I hope I'm able to answer the question. Yes, sir. Um, yes. Yes, sir. yes, yes. Thank you so much. All right, so but just to wrap up. Hello? Let's, let's but that's okay. Security post. All, All of right. them write their name on the, and, and the no, contract. No, I stepped step down. down the question. I stepped okay. down the question. Please, let's proceed, sir. Okay. With the webinar. Okay. Questions so maybe at the after. end, we ask the question at the end. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So, so this is the fundamental principles and rights at work, and is now five because a safe and a healthy working environment has now been embedded. So it's also very important because, to be honest with you guys, the HR function. How many of you understand that in the workplace, HR function is always easily listened to by the owner of the business? How many of us believe that? Can I get a response on the on the chat room? How many of you believe that the HR team always get the ears of the management? Yeah. Yes, the HR team, get, I mean, very easily, they get the ears of the owner of the business quickly. When safety is even still struggling to persuade, to beg, to ask for things to be done, once it's coming from HR, the owners of the business listen. They listen very quickly because that function is very close to that level. So if that function now knows that if HS is coming to demand for a safe workplace, it is their own goal as a right that they must protect because HR is very close and very related to labor matter. So in labor matter, is the HR that is in the forefront. So it is now a fundamental right and must be seen 
as that. So let's go to some of the role of HS and HR in an organization. And this just summarized, but there are so many discussion here that you see in subsequent slides. The HSC develops and implements the policies and the procedures for, for HSC in the workplace. Of course, they conduct risk assessment, they carry out safety audits, they do the monitoring of all the processes, they do training and education through awareness, advocacy, whatever you call the two bus talk, pep talk, you no know, weekly meetings, whatever way you call it, where information is given out. They ensure compliance with regulations, especially the HSC regulation. And this is big on governance. When I get to governance, I'll talk about that because HSC is a component of governance. Governance is within HR. So you see how it works. Investigating incidents and near misses, of course, one of those roles that HSC people do not like so much. Because anytime you have to investigate, you have already lost something. You have lost something. So it's a reactive role. But of course, Daniel said it the other time, it's a reactive role. Something that you have to do when something has gone wrong. They promote the safety culture. As a matter of fact, they help to build it. The safety has to build a safety culture. So when you now talk about an organizational culture of the workplace, safety is one of it. If the safety of the organization is not managed, there is no way the organization can be a good place to work. These days I see a lot of ranking, a, a best place to work, one out of 20 best place to work in the world. If safety is not managed in your workplace, your workers cannot say your place is a good place to work. So that means it's part of it. That organizational structure or culture that HR builds for the organization is safety is actually a component. If it is faulty, you cannot build a workplace where people are happy, where people are glad, where people say, oh, I don't mind if I'm not paid so much. I love where I work. It's as long as you don't have that as a function, it's not gonna happen. So we also monitor HSC performance and all of that. What about the HR recruitment? Looking for the right fit, the right peg in the right holes, the square pair of pegs in the square holes. They do onboarding, induction, you know, getting to know the business and all of that. They do employee relations and engagement. They're promoting company culture and values. So that's what I talk about organizational culture. It's HR that sit on it. Training and development, big part, big talent discovery, talent management, you know, and all of that performance management. And you see HSC does performance, but HR, they do that performance. So they have the structure, they have the knowledge to, to be able to, to appraise, to promote, to make sure that work is done, that the workers are doing their job as expected. Compensation and benefits, of course. If incident or cause, HR has to face the compensation. They are the ones that go for the negotiation, discuss the compensation and all of that. Policy creation, policy creation, implementation and organizational development, compliance with labor laws and regulation. And that's where I'm drawing, drawing the very strong point. Compliance with labor laws, health and safety is a labor matter. Please note, health and safety and environment is a labor matter. It's not, it's not a function that it just exists there without a parent. It sits in labor and it is HR that ensures compliance with labor laws, labor and regulation matters. Okay, so let's see. So what are developing responsibility where HR and HS actually intersect? I can see about six, no, different area within five that sits on where you see HR and HSE overlapping. These areas are the areas that always cause the conflict just because we do not have an understanding of the interplay. Where somebody feels you are stepping onto my own role or you are now usurping my own authority, who gave you the right? You know, are you an HR person? You are a safety person. Go and do your safety and leave, HS, leave HR alone. You know, I was um, I was involved in an incident investigation some time ago. And um, in the course of that, I went to the clinic to the HR and I said, I would like to get some data from the clinic. And the HR manager was like, excuse me, why? Those are confidential matters. And I said, I quite agree with you. 
I'm not here or interested in who is involved, but I need to see the data from the medical clinic to be able to understand a trend that is going on in the business with respect to this incident that happened. And it took a whole lot of discussion before I was finally given the opportunity to access the data. That's not a data I should beg for if there is an understanding that we are all working together. I want to get a data to study the trend of a particular occupational health issues and now is leading to issue in the business. And then I'm told, no, I cannot get it. It's an HR issue. HSC doesn't have anything to do with that. No, we have a lot to do with that because just seeing number of cases of a certain ailment in the clinic can tell me quickly where that safety issue is coming from. I can see it in my risk assessment. If I go back to the previous slide, you'll see where I talked about what HSC people do, conducting risk assessment and safety audits. So I can go back to my safety risk assessment quickly and check and say, oh my God, this incident and this trend that is increasing every month is because of this particular thing that is in the system. And that's our job. Rather than saying it's not your, oh, it's confidential, you can't get it. You should even be seeking to say, HSC, I don't know, we are getting this report from the clinic that people are getting ill and ill and ill. What do you think could be responsible? Because if you don't learn it, HR, you can't know it. It's not, it's not part of what you are taught in your curriculum. Risk, and I mean, I've seen a curriculum of an HR, of, I mean, the curriculum of HR graduates in Nigeria, where safety is missing completely. It's not there. In HR curriculum for a whole graduate of an HR without safety as a, a core content that he has to learn, then it shows quickly that you can graduate from that system, go through your professional courses, and you will not understand anything about basic safety. And now it relates to your job. So the issue of collaborative training programs, HSC and HR, we do train, as you see, we are very much involved in provision of training and education. The HR plans training, plans the development and ensure it is done. So that is one serious overlapping responsibilities that sometimes you can see an HR person saying, why are you the one choosing that course? Are you an HR person? Tell me the person, I will know what the person needs to do. I can look through the person's CV. I can look through this. I can look through, and I know what the person needs to learn. No, the HSC may be able to advise because they are the one on the feed. They are the one managing that process to be able to see that there's a gap in this knowledge. And when that knowledge is flagged, HR should be able to say, okay, you are the competent person in that area. I think I should agree with you. Not that, no, I'm the one planning training it's my job to plan training and all of that. Then you see, share responsibility for employee well-being. Of course, well-being is a child, big on a child, how the workers feel, how they perceive their sense of safety and all of that. But HSC contributes to that. HSC can tell if there is active well-being management in the workplace. Mutual involvement in incident investigation. This one is a big one. I've done so many investigations that the HR doesn't want to be part of it. They don't want to be part of it because when the incident has occurred, they sit there and waiting for the outcome of the investigation. They say, oh, the investigation has ended. What happened? Share the report with us. No, you should be in there because there are aspects of that investigation that only you, from your HR perspective and knowledge, will be able to decipher because investigation is about finding out what nobody wants you to know. And it's only through your knowledge that you can find that out. Combine effort in promoting organizational culture. HR builds organizational culture. HSC is a major component of organizational culture. So that means we work together in that area to build a single culture where somebody will say, I just love my workplace. That's not just because they are paying them a lot of salary. That's also because they are protecting them. You can be paid. So, I mean, I know people say, I only go to work to end the salary. If I see another job today, I'm out of here because I'm not feeling safe. I do not think they're protecting me, although they're still paying my bills. But when I see an opportunity, I'm going away. So improved salary, increased salary does not actually make a workplace a good workplace to, to, to work. 
there are more components. And I can tell you today, HSC is a major component that can make workers feel that sense that the workplace is a good place to work. Shared role in compliance management. HSE drive compliance. HR monitors compliance because legal infrastructure, legal register, a lot of those compliance issues are within the HR, within the governance, especially if it's an organization that does not have a full, robust legal department. If an organization does not have a full and robust legal department, the HR sits on the governance, sits on the compliance, and that is part of what safety. I don't know if you understand how many regulations that safety people have to monitor in their workplace, how many things that are bound by laws that they must obey. And if they don't enforce it, HR, we have problem in their governance structure. All right. And all of this, you can see joint policy development and implementation. That's what you have in the, in the, in the foundation. And they also have joint crisis management and planning. I want to challenge us here. If you're in HR and you are hearing what we are saying now, you need to consciously be involved in crisis management in your workplace. It's not just HSE function. It's also an HR role for you to be able to understand what will happen to the people when an emergency occurs. Then legal compliance. So this, I'm just going to go through all that I've explained here now. So you can see what legal compliance, HR, and HSC. See how they work together. Number one, understand the relevant HSC laws, ensuring proper documentation and record keeping, coordinating internal audits and inspections, updating policies, HR, and procedures to reflect legal changes. So when something changes, when the law changes, the HR must be aware of it. They must know and they must be ready to change their policy to suit the new regulation. Handling legal issues that relate to workplace incident, especially when it comes to compensation, when it comes to a whole lot of um, no prohibition, you know, they lock up an organization because of safety compliance. HR has a whole lot to play. Collaborating on discipline, disciplinary actions for safety violations. When safety infractions take place, HR has to be the one to do what? To issue the final, you know, consequence management. That's what we call it. The whole consequence management structure is in HR, which means if an HSC issue is breached, HR should be ready. The same way they will give query for someone who is stealing and hand over the person to the security. The same way they should be willing to also apply consequence for people that violate safety. And what I see in many organizations is safety violations have not been documented. There's no, there's no metrics. There's no, what you call, there's no structure to say this is the uh, consequences for safety infraction, but they have consequences for all that HR stuff. E.g., not coming to work more than three times in a week, uh, coming late to work, or no, no, absent without uh, leave, and all of that. They, they, they are consequences. I know every HR here has those consequences that have been documented as policy. The question is, do you have such consequences also documented on behalf of HSC you know, infractions? So that the HSC does not even need to worry himself that somebody has violated that HSC policy, HR will take action. Okay, young man, you are not coming to this office for the next four days for not wearing your PPE after three times warning. If that comes from the HR, it shows how HR is collaborating with HSC to make the workplace safe. But if that does not exist in the policy, remember, HR formulates policies. So policies on consequence management for HSC must be part of what HR has on their table. Documented, approved by the management, and enforced by the system. It's an HR that has the, cost, that the custodian of that. So that's legal compliance. Let's get to risk assessment, okay. So in under 10 minutes, I'll be rounding this up. Risk assessment, HR role in supporting HSE initiatives. So because HSE initiatives have to be driven, that's what we talk about, HSE programs. HSE people bring up program to ensure that the workplace is safe and the workers are safe. So how does HR support in this? 
providing workforce data for risk analysis. That was what I was talking about the other time. How can how can the HR go to the management to say, okay, I think we now need to institute a once in a month health work? Found out that our business, the obesity trend has increased by 40% in the last one year. That was one of the trends I did for the some time ago. It's not because we have been well paid. Suddenly, everybody is going fat. Now, when everybody starts becoming obese in the workplace, it's an issue. How did you find out? We we're able to trace that from data that was coming from the medical because they take their weight all the time. And they were able to find out that we are having 40% of the workforce becoming obese. And then we went to the HR to say, we need to institute a health work. Like health work, why do you need health work? No, every one Saturday in a month, we want all you to give us to the management approved two hours where all we are going to do in the workplace is just some gymnastics, some aerobics and all of that. Because our people are getting obese. If a child does not allow us access to that data, how do we prove it? Because the world is run by data, by the way. If you do not have a data, you're only another person with an opinion. So it is the data that helps us to run, and all these data are in HR. So it's only when HSE has access to those data that they can provide solutions to the problems. So they also assist in identifying just specific hazards. They support the implementation of control measures. That's HR. They help in incorporating risk assessment results in job descriptions. This is a very interesting one. When, when I had my conversation in IPMs, I think two or three years ago, and I was speaking, I said something that was very interesting. I actually wrote an article about it some years ago in one of the national dailies. And that article, I basically said, I said, uh, um, facing the HR in their games. Something like that. And what I said is, if an employee has been employed and you have been given a job description and the HR include in the job description the risk assessment, if you are the worker here, and I want anybody to talk if you are here, and HR, you got your job, you got your employment letter with the job description. And in that job description, there's a risk assessment that says, we have employed you as a radiographer. Being a radiographer here means you are going to be doing these jobs. It also means that in the course of this job, these things can happen to you. E.g., you can be exposed to radons. You can be exposed to radioactive materials that can cause cancer and can kill you and can denature your, your systems. And they put all of that in your employment letter. How many of us here will accept that kind of employment letter? Irrespective of how much they want to pay you. How many of us? Let me see you. If you accept the letter that clearly states the risk of what's going to happen to you when you are doing the job, and those risks are clearly stated, saying you can be a cancer age patient in 10 years because of the job that you're going to be doing for us. How many of us will accept the job? Let me see yes on the, I mean, we have a lot of people here. Let me see yes on the call. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> okay. I, I, I say, just answer for yourself, Priska. It's possible somebody wants to, you know, wants to accept that job. Because the money is good. Okay. So this was the challenge I threw at HR. And I told HR, I said, why you guys are not, I remember it was the, pre the president then of CIPM was when I was speaking and I said, when we HR start putting risk assessment in employment letter, can we drive that conversation? I've tried to drive the conversation on the Twitter space before. Let's drive the conversation. HR include risk assessment in employment letter. The only way you can include it is if you write also in that employment letter that while these are the risk of the job you are coming to do for us, we are also guaranteeing you that we have control in place to make sure they don't happen to you. That's why I talk about control measures here. If you don't put that in the letter, and the only thing I read is that and as a result of being a radiographer, I will have cancer and I will die. And you didn't tell me what you would do for me. Nobody will accept your job. You will look for that talent you will never find. Nobody will come in. But if you include in it that, oh, don't worry, these are the risks of the job, but I'm also telling you that I have control measures in place to make sure it does not happen to you. Then you have concluded the whole package. It is HR. 
Now, if that is not done in the employment letter, that has to be done by policy. And that's why risk assessment must be done. So if a risk assessment is not done, HR should be the first one to say, why is there no risk assessment for the job that people are doing? That means you are now looking at the safety and saying, safety man, why are these people doing job without knowing what can happen to them? Because risk assessment simply means what can happen to you. And you must know. So this is a very big collaboration between HR and HSA. HR has a big role in ensuring that every worker understands the risk of their job and the control that the company has put in place to make sure the risk is not materialized. And big one. But if only safety is the one driving it, then there's a problem. Because safety can drive it, but HR is the owner of policy. They are the owner of all the governance issue. So they must drive risk assessment. Incorporating risk assessment results into job descriptions. And of course, integrating risk awareness. So within the planning and training and development for HR, awareness on risk should be a training requirement. Not just a training because you need it. I mean a mandatory requirement. And this is what I've been telling people that I work with. HR, you must incorporate in your training plan a risk awareness training for all workers. It is, it is a crime and it is criminal for an organization to allow workers to work without the workers knowing the risk of their job. It is a crime. You should not allow them to, and somebody, I mean, I investigate this and somebody say, did you know this could happen to you? Nobody ever told me that this substance I'm working with will cost me an injury. That's a crime under the law. And so safety should not be begging for risk assessment or risk awareness training to be done. HR should put that in their own risk matrix right from the beginning. If you are in the carpentry, you are in the foundry, or you are in the chemical department, or you are in the office department, whichever department you have, there must be a risk awareness training. Since you cannot put it in the employment letter, it must be a training so that you can basically tell the workers, hey, I'm sure you are not aware, but this chemical you are working with can cause this. And the worker was like, wow, you didn't tell me before. Don't worry. This is why we're asking you to use this control. If you use these control measures, it won't happen. Let me give you an example. Many years ago, and I know it's still happening, organizations provide all manner of you know, things for their workers. Example is the issue of milk, providing milk and all of those things for workers. And then they get back to say, the workers collect the milk and go to sell. I say, okay, so why do you think they collect the milk and go to sell? You are giving them milk as a welfare. But you did not tell them that that make is not actually welfare. That make is a control measure for a certain thing you are doing to them. You provide make because you think they are being they are inhaling dust and they are inhaling smoke, and you need um, uh, make of magnesia to be able to help them. And you are providing the make for them on a weekly basis. But the workers collect the make and go and sell. Eventually, the workers break down. Why don't you tell them that this make is because there is a gas here that you are inhaling. This make is going to help you to neutralize it. That's what we are giving you. I'm sure you will know no worker will go and say that make. In fact, they'll be asking for more and drinking it in your presence. But you didn't tell them the reason why you are giving them the make. You're, they just see the make as the company likes us. So the company is providing make for us every month. No. If that's what they think, then they will say the make. And then they will come down sick. The HR will have to follow. So that's why you must let them know that this job can cause this, and that's why we are giving this make. This is HR in risk assessment as part of their collaboration with HSC. And then employee training and development, of course, this one we know very well, developing comprehensive training programs, looking at HSC needs, training needs, tracking and documenting training completion, scheduling, evaluating training effectiveness. I'm not just saying general training, but even HSE training, incorporating HSE competencies into career development plans. Fantastic. If you do a career development plan for a worker, is there an HSE competence that is included? This is missing in many. HSE is just seen as common sense. Oh, HSE, it's not just common sense. 
So when you see the whole career plan, this person is going to become a manager in five years. These are the things he needs to do. And you find out that you look at the whole content of what the guy is going to do. He's going to LBS. He's going to HR. He's going for conferences. But there's no HSC. Now, the question is, in five years of that growth, are there no HSC issues that you'll be facing as it's progressing? But nobody has incorporated any HSC because they don't think it's important for somebody you want to make a manager in five years' time. So if he does not understand safety, by the time he becomes management, he shuts down safety in the process. But if he has learned the safety as part of his career growth, by the time he becomes the manager, he will be the, at the forefront pushing for HSC for his workers. But if it does not include it in his plan as a career, he doesn't see it as a competence. So he just feels, I should be able to use my common sense. Like people say, safety is common sense. I'm sorry, safety is not common sense. Safety is knowledge. If you don't know it, then you cannot practice it. So it's not just wearing hard hat that is safety. There's so much into safety beyond what everybody sees as surface, which is basically the issue of wearing PPE. So, and they also promote continuous learning in HSC matters. Workplace culture. HR and HSC collaborate to build the workplace culture. And I've mentioned that organizational culture because safety is a core part of organizational structure. So develop a shared vision for safety culture. They facilitate communication for people to be able to say their safety concerns. HR has to bring that into their own profile that people can come and say, I, I feel I'm not, I don't think I'm, I feel safe anytime you're asking me to climb this high. I went for an investigation in the company some years back. During the conversation, somebody has actually fallen and all of that. And then I was talking to the colleagues and one of the persons said, sir, every time I'm going to that place to work, I'm always afraid. So I said, okay. Who have you reported to? Ah, he said, hey, report to. I cannot tell anybody. Who. If I, if I tell my HR or tell anybody who tell me, are you the only one going up there? If a worker can come to you genuinely and say, sir, every time you ask me to do this job, I'm always afraid that I'll be injured. It's your job as an HR or HSC person or any management person to say, come and tell me why you're always afraid. Maybe the control is not sufficient, but rather than being able to do an open communication like that, the person keeps quiet until somebody drops. And once somebody drops, they're waiting for the next person that will drop. And then you see, you're having accidents, which cost the business a whole lot of money beyond the reputation that you're going to have. And when your reputation is down, usually I know you know that it's HR that have to manage the reputation of the organization. They are the one that have to be running around to say we are good people, we are good company, we are good. No, you have done something that have already removed that part and is HSC. Promoting leadership, commitment to HSC, integrating HSC values into company mission and values. So we should actually bring HSC into the value proposition of your system to say safety is one of our core. We do it not just because we like it. We do it because it is our DNA. Is what we like to do. Recognizing and rewarding safe behaviors. You know, safety people want to reward people that have been doing safety well. HR is saying, what's the meaning of that? They know any salaries. No. <laughs> rewarding safe work is part of what HR should promote. As a matter of fact, it should be in your budget. As part of what you want to use in your collaboration with your uh, health and safety team. Addressing cultural barriers to HSE compliance. Employee well-being. Developing holistic well-being programs, addressing both physical and mental health concerns, <clears throat> implementing stress management initiatives, stress management, uh, managing return to work programs after injuries or illnesses, collaborating on economics and workplace design. These are all issues about well-being. Again, HR leads in this. HSC will do the analysis, but HR has to make sure this happens. And their performance, of course, this is the big deal for H HR team. They are the ones that incorporate HSC into objectives, including HSC KPIs in performance evaluation. So it means, therefore, we can no longer do appraisal if we really want to make HSC part of what we do. We can no longer do appraisal without considering safety as an element of appraisal. One of my clients, about four years or five years ago, when they, when they have been having issues and issues, I, I pitched to the management and said, 
why not make safety a minimum of 10% in every manager's KPI? That narrative changed your thing. You see somebody say, ah, don't come and have accidents here. 10% of my mark will disappear if that thing happens. But if HSC is not a KPI for a management person or a worker, how then do you get safety from him? And who can incorporate it? It's HR that does performance. You are the one that have the checklist. You have the template. Have we included safety as a percentage of the KPI? Even if it's 5%, let it be part of it to say, we are also watching how safe you are as a worker. We are watching how you are obeying safety rules. If you don't, you will lose 10% during your appraisal and people will begin to embrace safety. So performance uh, evaluation with HSC, recognizing it, addressing poor HSC performance, linking HSC performance to career progression. I said that earlier on. Providing feedback on HSC behaviors and using HSC data to inform talent management decision. And a lot of HSC data that can help you in your talent management. It can even help you determine who is supposed to be in that your succession planning, who is supposed to be the next person in that department. HSC can be a very good tool that can help you decide that. All right, rounding up now. So recruitment and onboarding, incorporating HSC co uh, consideration as well. Competencies and requirements, candidates' HSC awareness and attitude, providing role-specific HSC training for new hires, evaluating HSC performance during probationary periods, integrate the HSE in orientation into onboarding. Of course, I know a lot of organizations do that right now, but how much do we do that? You have done all induction. There you say, oh, last one now, I'll let it be for HSC. You are actually turning it upside down. In organizations that have positive safety culture, the starting point of onboarding is HSC. Because the first day of the worker in your factory, he can be injured the very first day that he steps in, he can sustain an injury. So in organizations that have safety in their DNA, HSC induction is the very first primary induction to be done before you start going to a down body system. Before you even allow the student, the trainee or the new hire to go into the factory, he has done HSC, he has passed it before you now say, okay, let's go to the factory. But in some places, it's last minute they remember, oh, we don't even have HSC in this induction though. I will come and talk to them for one five minutes on what they need to do. It means you have not seen HSC as part of what you need to do in your onboarding and your recruitment process. Policy development. So I've also mentioned that creating HSC policy and other policies to include HSC matters, ensuring alignment with company values, incorporating legal and regulatory requirements, you know, consulting with employees and stakeholders, communicating policies effectively across the organization, and of course, reviewing and updating your policy performance, and then communication strategies as well. You know, it's also one key area that HSE role finds in HSC, in HR, HR in HSC. Managing change in the workplace. HSC can help you manage those changes when there are changes, when there are disruptions in the system. I mean, all of us can remember what happened during the COVID-19. So nobody needs to be preached to that. Even the HR people now understood that HSE is very important. You know, we don't need another COVID to bring HR to understand that HSC is part of them because indeed we are, you know, part of that process. So developing comprehensive crisis management plans is part of what HR needs to focus on. Roles development, conducting joint crisis simulation, providing support for employees, conducting post-crisis review, all of these are functions that HR can manage together. So what are the, what is the six key benefits in my final discussion here? The six benefits of strong HR, HSA partnership. Number one, it enhances safety culture and reduces workplace incidents. Number two, it improves your legal and governance. Your legal compliance and governance, bring HSA in, you will improve your legal compliance. Increase employee well-being, satisfaction and retention. And I think that's what every HR wants. And HR always say, oh, it's very expensive. Do you know the cost of hiring somebody else? Yes, you can reduce that cost through retention 
And HSE is one of those fundamental to help you do that. There's cost savings when you reduce accidents. There's company reputation that comes to the fore just by including all of that. And finally, operational efficiency based on your organization resilience. What are the future trends? So this is what we should be looking at that is happening now and will continue to happen between HR and HSC. We are now beginning to see integration of IoT, AI, wearables between HSC, things that are monitoring your health that you don't even need a doctor to tell you. And all of these are becoming the future trend between HR and HSC. Addressing emerging risk, remote working, for example, I'm sure a lot of us are in our homes now. I'm working from my home, remote working. Some of us work one, two days uh, out of the week from home. What's happening to you while you're at home? That's the future if you don't know. More work from home is going to happen. COVID made it happen and we're not going back to how we used to do it. So if you're going to do that, then we need to understand that these trends, HR and HSC need to be working together to be able to, dis to, to design how this system will work. Those that are working from home in your system, is there any HSC policy, HSC monitoring, HSC KPI for them when they're working from home? Something to think about. Focusing on sustainability and social responsibility. So HR, CSR, HSC is a big part of, of, of CSR. That's what we are calling today the sustainability initiatives. Adapting to changing workforce demographics and expectations and preparing for new regulations and global standard. So for HR, HR persons here, these are a few but very fundamental focus area. And I want to challenge you that this area requires knowledge, requires some learning. These learnings, you will not get them in, a, in HR discussion. You need to get into HSC and learn it. HSC fundamentals, you need to know it as an HR person. In fact, you are not a complete HR professional if you don't know HSC fundamentals. Because that's the reason why the struggle is there. By the time you know some fundamentals in HSC, it allows you to be able to understand what HSC does in your business. And you need to learn it. Either way, virtual, physical, in person, online, you will need to learn HSC fundamentals. If you don't learn it, you won't know it. And you'll still be doing your HR the way it is, which is not what we're looking at here. Social sustainability or sustainability as a full package is a learning. It's something you need to learn. Economics, workplace economics, you need to learn it. Well-being and wellness. Yes, HR think they know it, but I can challenge you that you will find that there's, there are so many you don't know. If you don't go and learn what well-being and wellness means. Mental health. Mental health. It's not an HR thing unless you learn it. Workplace stress, compliance management, emergency response, and very last one, labor standards. These are all competent subject matters that HR people need to go for and learn. And I want to challenge you to try and create time. Look for places where you can learn this. Uh, as a business, I mean, hybrid, this is our focus here because our knowledge of this area is why we're able to interface very clearly with HR to let them know what they need to learn. Because indeed, we are learning from what, what we need to learn from HR. But because I'm speaking to HR people here, you have some core areas in safety that you must put in your career progression. It has to be in your learning plan. If you don't have it, you will struggle in the modern HR management that involves HSC. Finally, the synergy between HR and HSC is like the body's immune system. It does not just react to threats. It proactively creates an environment where the entire organization can flourish. This is by Dr. Todd Cochlin, a human and organizational performance expert. The synergy between HR and HSC is like the body immune system. It doesn't just react to threats of diseases or problems. It proactively creates the environment to make sure that the organization or that your body can function. So it creates that environment to make sure your organization is flourishing. And this is very good because HR is about organizational 
uh, achievement and flourishing. HSC helps you to do that within. So I say in my last word here, a safe workplace, which I put in bracket HSC, is a productive workplace. And that's the HR. So when you talk about productivity, that's what HR is chasing. And when we talk about safety, that's what we are chasing. So when the workplace is safe, HSC, it automatically becomes a productive workplace and HR can take the glory. Thank you so very much, everyone. Uh, I hope I've been able to say a little and I'll wait for your question after now. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you so much for the knowledge, wealth of knowledge, experience you have shared. I love the energy, the passion. In fact, if England plays the way you have spoken, they will win the, they will win the match. It's still 0-0, zero, zero, by the way, just to, to update you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be taking the first question quickly from Ade Yemi Kolapo. If you have a question, either type it quickly in the chat box or raise your hands and we recognize you. Keep it straight and direct, please. Ade Yemi, you have the floor. Good afternoon, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We, we know he's Sorry, calling from evening. Canada. He's in Nigeria. <laughs> I see you. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, please, my question will be very straight. You know, we have so many sectors in Nigeria. We have the banking sectors. Let me be peculiar to the FMCG sectors. FMCG, okay. Yeah, every, everything is all about sales, 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 like that. So you talk about compliance to mm. HLC. We have HLC officer, you understand. So I just want to understand in such sectors from your broad experience, how do you think HLC can strive and achieve its goals? You know, because you know, the overall objective of the organization is to make sales, you know, and anything that doesn't bring money to organization, <laughs> organization does not value that. You understand? Mm -hmm. So you preaching HLC to management and preaching HLC to HR, they'll see it as a mundane thing. You understand what I'm saying? So how be it, and you know this can be done. So I just want to ask from your own experience, how do you think we can ensure that in such organization? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, FMCG. So let me answer that very quickly. FMCG is a very peculiar for most of us, the FMCG is fast moving consumer goods. And in FMCG operations, it's about the units. It's about the SKUs, those one one thing that you are producing. And sometimes one hour delay, the product is not complete and there's an issue. So I work very closely with FMCG. And I can tell you the challenge in that industry is primarily a poor understanding of how safety contributes to that target that they are creating. Because if they can see the importance of the safety to the target, then, and you said something here now, which is the same word that everybody always use. They say, if it does not contribute to the bottom line, then we are not listening. But do you know that safety contributes to the bottom line? This is the mathematics that a lot of people have not understood. I mean, I've done several courses on HSC as a cost or a profit center. And when I bring those things to the table, unless you really understand it well by knowledge, you cannot believe that safety contributes to that target. Because for many people, safety is a cost center. That's what they see. Safety costs us money. But I mean, for those of you who are a bit numerical here, you understand that there are two ways to make profit in life. One is to continue to produce. One is to reduce your cost. So the question I always ask is, which is easier, more production or cost reduction? And everywhere I've spoken to top leaders in this, I mean, I've been privileged to speak to top leaders in FMCG. They always come back to the fact that, ah, when we save costs, it's better for us because we can produce more and we're unable to sell. So safety is the cost reduction element in your business. If you do not understand that safety reduces your cost, then you cannot understand how safety makes the money. And that is the knowledge that FMCG have not come to understand. When they know that, then it will be very easy for them to say, every safety initiative is a cost reduction that increases our profits. And that's it. So if we have any other time I can, you know, non-safety metrics in business, it's a different topic entirely. 
and that will be able to let people understand how safety is not a cost center, but it's a profit because it's an input of business, so it's a profit to the business. But you must see it from aspect of cost reduction rather than increase in your production. It does not increase production, it reduces the cost of your production. All right, thank you. So I hope I'm able so to much. answer that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll take experience. Experience, you have the floor. Yeah, yeah. good evening. Uh, my question is very is a straight one. For those that uh, are working uh, in a drilling location, in a rig, be it a gas well or uh, uh, a crude oil well, uh, what is the relevance of this uh, mic that they normally give? What is the relevance? So, thank you very much. I, I mentioned, okay, so I mentioned that mic because it's also in many organizations as well, that mic is given in error. And I will explain. The mic is a control, it's, it's a drink, but it has a content that is able to remove dust and smoke. And it's called the mic of magnesia. That mic is not just the normal mic you buy on the shelf. It's a mic that has a good quantity and content of magnesium that is able to reduce the elements that are within the dust and the smoke that you are inhaling. So when you are given is to reduce possible uh, inhalation that you have had. And that's what I was trying to explain. But that is never told to the workers. It is, it is given to them like a benefit. You are collecting seismic every week and you're happy. And once they collect the milk, they go to the next shop and sell. And then they come down and forsake. So it's actually medical. That, that make is a medical, it's, it's a control. It's within the control hierarchy of those administrative control that you give to manage that smoke inhalation and dust. But unfortunately, it's not the normal make that people give that everybody is getting. I'm not saying that make may not be able to do something. Otherwise, if the make does not do anything, why are they not giving them uh, other provision like Milo or sugar? Or So why is it make they are giving them? So that should tell you that there is a content in that make that they expect to do something, but it's not the exact. I worked in the oil industry most of my life, so I know what you're talking about. And I know this is something that we're fighting then because if you are not giving them the right information, they will not use it. So if you give a control measure without the right information, it will be abused. And that's what was happening then. Thank you very much, experience. Thank you so much. We quickly take Bukola Messi. You have the floor next, Bukola. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, sir. Good evening, Thank you sir. very much for this insightful and impactful um lecture. Um, I must say I'm seeing things in a new light right now. I I used to think I know, but obviously I need to learn. So um, thank you for this. So um, my question now is um, similar to the person that asked questions around sales. Now, um, for instance, uh, where I work, we um, have a lot of employees that travel to rural areas because of the nature of the job. They are always on, on the move, going from one community to the other, engaging farmers, basically. And um, you know, Nigerian roads are... I pray Nigerian roads does not happen to anybody, but you know, it's, it baffles me and scares me because I really don't know what to put in place for such. I've been racking my head. I think um, I need help with regarding that. I don't know if you can help with some safety um, precautions for such okay. employees. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. So basically, that's why one of those slides I talked about risk assessment. So what you're actually asking for now is the risk assessment of those workers. And for you to do the risk as well of the workers, you must be able to basically highlight in details. What do they do? How do they do it? How do they get to where they do it? So that will include logistics and transportation, the means of transportation, the work that they do, the time that they move. When you do all of that within that risk as a structure, you will be able to look at the task, look at the hazards of those each task, look at the risk of the hazard and look at the control measures. So. I don't mind if after now you want to reach out to me, I'm able to provide you a guideline 
on that kind of job and just share a generic template of risk assessment with you because that risk assessment is what tells you what to do. Right here, we cannot say, oh, provide them with this, provide them with this, because there are many things within the scope of what they do that may need to be analyzed before you decide the best control measures. So that's why risk assessment is the solution to that. So, I mean, my contact is here, so you can reach out to me after now. I'll try and give you a bit of guideline on that, if you don't mind. Thank you so much, sir. We'll be taking the last voice question and then check the chat on Zoom to see if there are any questions there. Tony Lawson, you have the floor. Tony, I can't hear you in case you are speaking. Or do you need milk? <laughs> okay. I think um, you may have network um, challenges. So we quickly switch to Daniel. Daniel, to your question, please. Okay. Um, I really appreciate the presenter. He has spoken well on this call. But I just have um, some concern about with the HR and their need for for we to do more. Because um, when it comes to employees' health, of course, employees' health details are very confidential and primarily to 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 HR. And most times they don't share share it with any other party, even though they have a um, nurse in the factory or in the manufacturing environment. But if an employee is an iPad or is hypertensive or have underlying health issue, it is only known to HR and the HR will not identify the person. The safety person is always on the field going around seeing this person and it does not know if this person have this health issue or doing or doing some tasks the person has been told not to do and we will say this um, health issue is confidential so i think we um, we need to share some information with the hsa personnel on the plant so that they too, they will be aware. Of course, they can sign confidential hoods that they will not disclose anything they see or that comes across them. So I think sharing details of employee, especially on health issue, um, should not only be with the HR team alone and also with the, the HSC personnel. And the issue of um, induction, I've worked in a site whereby a visitor sued my company to court mm -hmm. because the visitor came, yes, a visitor, he, he came to site and he strip and fall on the staircase. And he said we are the cause That's of right. the uh, injury. And we said how, he said we did not tell him or her that this thing will happen to him when he joined the firm. So mm. please, I think we HR team need um, to do more in, in, in um, promoting safety. Of course, we all, uh, um, especially MCG, we all, we are after production, but the safety team, they are to ensure safe production. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's a comment, so I'll just leave it like that. But I want you to know that that's why we are sharing this. Why we are not interested in confidential information, we need data. We need data to advise the HR on what to do. Um, I had an incident in the, in the company recently where somebody passed on and it was an health issue which was not discovered or was not managed. And the HR, HSE didn't know HR was aware until the person died. So, no, we're not interested. Confidential issue, I know is HR, but that data, we need it to advise. If I know somebody has a high BP, 
I will never allow the person to go and work at tight. So if you say the person is a scaffolder, I will say you give the person another job to do. You can't be a BP person having a BP and they are working at tight. So that my job tells me you cannot be at tight. But HR may not know that being a BP person, being at height is, you know, you are working at the differential and it will cause you trouble. So that's why that data is very important. Even if the names are not there, but if you don't have the data, we cannot advise HR. So basically, HSC is an advisor to the HR function. We are supposed to be the advisor. We are supposed to be the one telling you that based on what we are saying, please take this action. And that's how it is. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you so much. We'll take one more question that is written here, but just before that, I just want to pass a comment. You know, I've worked in an organization before that it was HSC that was actually responsible for the medicals, oh, oh. employment medicals. So when you pass the interview and get to that stage after all the interviews, it is HSC that will mail you, Advice. send you for the medical. It is HSC that will get the medical reports and now advise HR if they can proceed with IR with respect to the specific role. Wow. That was the one one out of I, I, I'm sure you are not speaking about Nigeria, are you? It's Nigeria is Lagos. I can tell you offline. I worked there. Bravo. As HR. That's it. It was in one service. That's what we're that's what we're advocating because it's it's, it's us. We are the one our advice. We are the one that knows the risk assessment of the job. So thank you, sir. That's what we want. <laughs> okay. So Ibro has a question here, which will be our final question. I will wrap up. He says, what should an HSC supervisor do when some junior and senior managers does not show commitment to OHS procedures? Go to HR. If the HR is have you, because if they don't listen to you, and that's why I said the HR is very powerful in organization. If HR has a synergy with safety, safety will work. I can assure you, if there's a synergy between HR and safety, safety will work. Because when a worker says he doesn't want to listen to you and he hears that HR is going to call him, he will, he will immediately listen. They can ignore safety, but they can't ignore HR. And that's why the HR must step out to support safety because they are being reckoned with in the organization. Management listen to them. Uh, regulators listen to them. Board, board of directors listen to HR. And you know, in some places, HR director is in the management, but HSC manager may not be there. HSC manager may just be in the middle level, but you say an HR director, he sits with the board. So when HR decides to, to support and they get HSC to do their job, for the person asking that question, if your HR is in support, just take the person to HR. If they have the consequence management, they will act. But if the HR does not support you, I'm sorry, you don't have management support in the business and there's nothing you can do about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your wealth of wisdom and experience here. Ladies and gentlemen, we can unmute now and say thank you. I want us to use you know, oh, our voice to say our appreciation. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, 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 thank you,